Right. Let's get started. So hopefully you enjoyed the discussion last Wednesday and working on your assignment three. Hopefully that's probably the easiest among the four assignments. I hope that's the case. So, oh, and okay. I think um, I forgot to update the announcements. So um, this announcements are all out of date, by the way. There are not that many, so I'll just actually say then write. So um, apparently assignment three is out. Hopefully everyone is aware of that. It is due one week from today, so next Monday. So you might think it's too soon, but assignment three is relatively easy because uh, you just have to write a two page paper. And if you're working on a project, then you can basically write a paper on that or otherwise you can also try to write a, a fake paper. If you have written paper before, then um, I'll say it's fine to actually um, use that too. So hopefully it's more of a free assignment for many of you, if you have written a paper, especially. So um, it's, um, I think relatively easy assignment. So hopefully that's fine with everyone. And I think really the important announcement is that now we are more than halfway through the class. So congrats, you, are, you made all here. And um, now on, we'll be really talking about the modern NLP techniques. So up to now, I think you can think of it as more of a history plus uh, very basic things that although it's good to know and it's useful to know, uh, but then you will not be using that much these days because um, it's, you have the, the paradigm has changed. So, but now on what we're gonna talk about is very, um, very, I would say, uh, very uh, bleeding edge, right? So it's a thing that you'll be using whenever, whatever you do now on. So uh, it will be good to actually be very, um, you know, very knowledgeable of these things that will be very helpful for um, throughout your research in NLP and machine learning. And I think that we can just go back to this cl class roadmap again. And I think I'm repeating the same message again to emphasize, but um, so we have been through this all up to here. And I told you that the vanilla learning is uh, the, the really the, the, the traditional supervised learning method with MLE estimation. So these are basically just give the uh, training data that uh, you're gonna this, that the, the data that's similar to what you're gonna see in the test time or inference time, and basically you try to tune your model so that your model becomes very have, has a very your model has very small loss in your training data, so that at the end of course because training data and the inference test time data are coming from the same population, there is a statistical. Um, I would say statistical um, guarantee that if you have enough number of data, then you're, um, you will be getting better and better as you um, basically do really well on the training data, if you're not overfitting, of course. So that was the case. And I think it was very straightforward because it's very um, mathematically well-founded, but now we are going into a more, uh, a region that's a, a bit more, I would say, less mathematically founded, but more empirical in some sense, because now here are a lot of things now, people are trying to still explain why that's working, but we don't have a really clear mathematical explanations. We have some intuitions why those things work, but um, in many cases, the intuitions are the only, um, I would say, way that we can understand those things. And it really depends on what kind of person you are. If you are really a mathematically oriented person, you might feel a bit uncomfortable because how, how, how do they work? You, you want to know that, but I, I'm sorry, but we don't really know. We don't really know why something works better than the other things. It's just more of an empirical things. But if you're really a, a more of an intuitive person, then maybe it now becomes easier to follow because 
a lot of things that are happening here now are really intuition driven. So um, it's really important for you to be uh, a bit more, I would say, intuitive than until now. I think uh, I wanted to say that because um, really the pre-training and fine tuning is also mathematically sometimes not so, I would say, persuasive. Although, of course, there are um, a lot of work that trying to really prove mathematically why these things worked. Okay, so, so we're gonna basically cover pre-training and fine-training for the, I think, next, I would say, until like last one or two classes. We want, we're gonna only devote one or two classes, probably one class, I think, on this, because the in-context learning is more of a, I think, very recent one very recent one. Um, and um, in many cases, what you're gonna be using is uh, pre-training and fine tuning. Okay, so let's uh, get into um, pre-training and fine tuning, which is I think um, probably um, also really the most exciting transition or turning point in NLP community. Um, not just like in recent 10 years, but I think um, personally, I think people remember this moment um, for many, many um, years, like maybe in, you know, 100 years, they all still think that this was a very transition moment. So let's first uh, take a look into what I mean by vanilla and pre-training, or um, in other words, what's the difference between transfer learning and um, yeah, supervised learning? So you can think of this as the vanilla learning that we just talked about until now. Um, and I try to say vanilla in the previous slide because transfer learning is also supervised. It's just that there is one more additional component on top of supervised learning. So I think many of you remember what supervised learning, how it works. And there are several ways to train a neural network model, but we observe that the most dominant way is maximum likelihood estimations, right? So what was this about? You basically try to um, tune your model so that the model will be equipped with a probability distribution of um, y given x, right? And you want to basically maximize that for your training data. So you want to find a configuration that maximizes your training data's um, probability distribution. Or in other words, if you compute the loss as negative log likelihood, then you basically want to minimize that. So you basically try to define loss function as something like negative log of a probability of a y given x. Of course, if you have a multiple data points, then this will be more of a you're basically trying to p of y given x i, right? And because you can um, take out the pi the, the pro product out of log, then this will be basically negative summation of log probability of y i given x i. Right. And that's exactly what you want to um, minimize. That's why it's called maximum likelihood estimation. And in order to maximize this or minimize this loss, then you just have to put in your training examples, xi and yi. So this is very simple and also very statistically very strong way of learning a model. But in many cases, your training data might not be big enough, right? Maybe this works when you have n is equal to something like 10,000. But what if your training data is much smaller? So if you really think about this situation, then there are maybe two um, approaches that you can think of. You can maybe just try to fit in a model with uh, such small training data. Suppose that your new n prime is like 10. Maybe you can also try to train a model with this n prime. Then your um, training will be really fast, but does it work well? 
No, because uh, we have seen this and it, there, there are a lot of uh, ways to explain this, but one way to explain is that basically we have a relatively large model with a lot of parameters and number of parameters, it's much larger than N, then maybe it doesn't work because it overfits really well. Although actually I want to also say that this is not entirely true in the um, in a very recent machine learning, um, I would say trend. So what I'm trying to say is in a more traditional, here traditional means like maybe two years ago, then people thought that, oh, still we need um, less number of parameters compared to number of training examples so that we can actually avoid overfitting. But nowadays, actually, we know that if N is big enough, then it's really hard to overfit anyways, even if the model is super large. So. Actually, people just try to make the model bigger and bigger, but we're going to get back to that later. But for now, let's talk about traditional machine learning. So then if we have an N equal 10,000, then maybe it's fine for most neural networks. But if N is like 10, N prime is 10, that we know in many cases, this will overfit. So what can we do? And that's exactly what's the really the motivation of uh, transfer learning in many cases, because, okay, suppose that we trained a model, uh, say text classification model with 10,000 examples. And probably if, if you wanna really do well on this text classification, the model has probably learned something while doing that task. It has to know which words are positive, which words are negative, et cetera. So suppose that the task is hard enough that it requires the model to learn these things. Can we somehow use that knowledge for another task that has relatively small number of uh, training examples? Or maybe even if training examples of target task is not too small, can we benefit from another task? Uh, can we benefit from a model that has been trained on another task? So that was a really intriguing and also maybe difficult question back then because, well, we know that humans can do that kind of, which we call generalization. We learn something here and then we want to generalize that knowledge to other tasks. But is that also doable for machines? Is that easy enough? That's a really important question that we want to answer. And that's, that's really the point of a transfer learning. It's, that's really the, the, the real definition of transfer learning. Um, you have a two task, right? Um, task one and task two. And task one allows you to create a model. Suppose I'll call it M. Then um, task two allows you to create a model too. And this of course has um, some performance, right? That's great because your model has been trained on task two and has uh, some performance. So the same as your model one has task uh, has been trained on task one and has some performance, some accuracy basically. But uh, can you create P2 that's better than P2 by leveraging M1? Or of course T1 directly. That is really the uh, definition of transfer learning. Of course, we have to assume that those two tasks are similar enough or have some common things so that learning task one can be beneficial for task two. So that's the definition of TL. And it's, it's very, um, very promising if this can be done, but it's not super clear given um, neural networks, how can we actually transfer knowledge? So, um, well, I mean, uh, it's very, it's not, it's not, there are not that many ways to do that, to be more exact, because there are some obvious ways that I'm gonna talk about. And maybe there are other ways that we're not too sure how um, yet, how they can happen. But let's talk about obvious ways first. Um, so what is that? It's actually um, called fine tuning. So what is, what is this? So it's, it's very actually simple. So what, what do you do? So you basically have a two task, right? Task one and task two. 
So you first create a model that's on task one, so that you create M1, but you don't really care about the performance on, on this task one. It's just to trying to create a model that works on T1. And then once you try to create a, a model for uh, T2, what you usually do is actually, um, you basically start from um, some, I would say, uh, random, randomly initialized model to, and you basically use SGD to create a model two, which is the, the same case for T1. In task one, you also started from random initialized model and then you use stochastic gradient descent with the, the current task data, training data to get to um, the M2, right? Uh, uh, M1, I mean, but then um, what you do when you're trying to apply transfer learning is instead of uh, starting from the uh, random vectors, you instead tr start with the M1 parameters of course, you will have to then uh, create a model that's exactly same as, I mean, architecture wise same, but uh, the, the parameters are not randomly initialized, but you start with the M1's parameters and you just continue training with that. that that's, that's basically fine tuning. And now you see why it's called fine tuning because you're really tuning the model further from task one to task two. And then what do you call the, the process of uh, creating the model on the um, T1? You have to start with uh, uh, the random vector here, right? So this is called pre-training. Now you get why it's called pre-training and fine tuning, right? It's pre-training because you are actually training, but it's not the purpose of your target task. It's not on your target task, but it's on some another task that's happening before your target task. And you, your main training is fine tuning because you're not starting from scratch, but you're starting from the pre-trained model and you're just basically tweaking that so that it fits your needs. So, um, hopefully that's clear. Okay. Um, so that's like a really dominant way of transfer learning. And um, we haven't seen a lot of successful cases of transfer learning other than this. And very recently, what we talked about, which is the in-context learning. So that's why um, I'm putting that as a you know, separate box from pre-training and fine-tuning because they are very different. We're going to talk about that in probably last lecture or very close to the end of um, this semester's class. But for now, just uh, let's talk about pre-training and fine-tuning. So where was this used in the early um, deep learning era? So actually, this was very dominant way of doing things in computer vision. So it's not the scope this class of, so I'm not gonna go into details how you create an image classification model, but you can think of it as uh, many layers of uh, convolutional neural networks, which is quite similar to, I would say, um, in some sense, I mean, you can think of it as a layer that's uh, similar to dense layer, but more efficient and more inductive bias into it. Um, it's not really important which, which architect architecture you use, but the point is that it's called VCC16. It's one model, just one model that uh, does image classification. And image classification is simply, you put an image into this model and the model is able to tell you which class out of like 1000 possible classes this image belongs to, like cat, dog, or horse, computer, etc. So this is a, a simple classification model. And there are a lot of images for this. It's really easy to create such data set that you can create very massive data set for image classification, oftentimes easily in order of millions. And basically, once you have trained a model, in this case, it's called VGG16, you use that to whatever task you want to do other than image classification. 
so you might want to do more complicated things like detection. So what is detection? Maybe I should have prepared an, an image for that, but detection is you have an image and then you have a person, right? And you have a car maybe. I'm not really a good drawer, but, but then uh, you might want to not just figure out what are in the image, but then you want to figure out where the person is and where the car is. So you want to draw a box. That this is a person and also label that with person. And you also want to do a draw a box around the car and label that with the car. So this is called object detection. And of course, this has more use cases than simple image classification. It's actually super set problem. I mean, of uh, image classification because if you can do object detection well, then very likely that you can do image classification easily. But it's really hard to create a data set for this because you have to, not hard, but I mean relatively, because you have to actually draw a line around the person and then also classify that. It has more work to do, so it's more expensive. Furthermore, um, it's very likely that a model for this will be a bit more complicated than image classification, right? Because you have to actually think about where the box lies, not just the class labels. So for many years, even now, um, people have, uh, what people have tried to approach this problem from is that they basically uh, create a model, but they do not start from scratch, but they actually put this image classification model in the middle of the entire pipeline. So this image classification model is able to map the image into some dense, some vector that it's called descriptor that it basically describes the image as a vector. So here um, you see that um, actually in this case though, it's not actually just using the vector, the, the output vector, but they actually use the intermediate, intermediate layers output. So they, they have a vector for each location of the image but they use the VG16, sometimes not entire VG16, but just like for instance, first three layers, right? And then just they just basically put that on top of the, um, I mean, they, they basically just put that and then they just build another model on top of that. So in this case, your um, target model is not exactly same as the pre-trained model but it is actually containing the pre-trained model or a part of the pre-trained model. And these are all randomly initialized. So this part is all randomly initialized. I'll just put zero for that. But this part is actually coming from um, some another model that's basically subset of uh, the, the VGG16 subset being first few layers because VGG16 as the name suggests, has 16 layers, and maybe it's using only first few layers in this case. So this has proven to be really effective in image computer vision domain. And in the early deep learning uh, era, it was like uh, really the, the standard in many cases. And even now, people use more advanced networks like ResNet, and even the VGG16 is still being used in many cases. So that's, that's great. Um, and has NLP um, doing that too? Kind of uh, in the same era. So that using VG16 for you know downstream tasks was there like since 2014, for instance. And in 2014, we also uh, NLP community also had things called pre-trained word embeddings that probably many of you have already used in your assignments. So it was actually one of the first practical applications of pre-training. Although um, it's relatively more, as, as I would say, relatively simpler. So I think now you know what the word to vec and glove is. Hopefully, we can you can go back to lecture two if you want to uh, know more about it. And I also have put some related work reading list if you are interested. But the point is that you create a model that can train a word embedding, so that you can put this in your model. And very easy, just replace the word embedding parameters in your model with the pre-trained vectors. There are two 
really the cases that we have to consider actually not just the pre-trained word embeddings, but in, uh, in general, when you're trying to fine tune a model, um, do you actually, I would say, I mean, it's, there is actually a one important thing that um, I would say you have to be careful about the wording. So when I say fine tune, I mean that um, the, the parameters are actually get updated with the stochastic gradient descent. But you might choose not to fine tune it and still train the model. Because for instance, in the image classification, you can just fix, you can just freeze here and you can still train this part at the same time. Then this frozen part can be just considered as some function without any variables that can be tuned. And um, actually people have tried different ways and the freezing and fine tuning are useful in different cases. So I cannot say there is a one single answer and it's the same case for the word embeddings too. There are actually cases that it, you might want to fine tune the word embeddings, or you might not want to fine tune, but rather freeze them. Why? Um, there are some explanations. You might want to fine tune them because you want the model to be more flexible so that it can be more, uh, vectors can move around. But you might also not want to fine tune because it's, there's, especially in word embeddings, because if you actually fine tune, then you can only give gradient updates to words that you have seen during training. But what about those words that you haven't seen in the training? And if they appear in the test time, then basically these words compared to those words that have been observed during training time will be very different. They will be in the different, I will say, in the, in the, the vector space because the, they have shifted. So some words that have been, have been seen during training have shifted from their original places but some words that have not been seen during training will st still stay the same. And maybe those direct discrepancy might cause some issues. So in many cases, when you actually freeze the word embeddings, they work better. But this of course also depends on the training data size because if your training data is big enough and they actually, um, if you, you, actually are, you actually update the gradients for all the words, then maybe you don't have to worry about that. So what I want to say is that there is no single answer whether you freeze or fine tune. Okay. And then, so, um, and then people thought, okay, pre training word embeddings are great. So this was like around since like 2014, right? Um, that was like word to back. And there was also glove, etc. But people thought, okay, that's great, but it's still very different from how image classification is used because in image classification, you, uh, your uh, VGG16 model is able to contextualize all the information together. But in the word embeddings, apparently that's not happening. You're only, you're embedding the words meaning, but the words meaning can be very, I would say there is a, it's a, it's, it's polysemy, right? Words can have different meanings. So, the meaning of the word can depends on its context. So it doesn't really make sense to just depend or just rely on the word embeddings. So really the question is, um, what will be the um, image classification equivalent of NLP? And can we do a similar thing that image classification did and benefit from pre-trained models? And of course, if you just, um, look at the uh, word image classification, then okay, why not text classification? Just same as image classification. We did this in your first assignment, right? So we have uh, trained a model for sentiment classification. It's a, a, one of the most popular text classification tasks. Then can we use that model for other tasks? So it 
people maybe thought that that could be the case, but it turns out that empirically not so effective. Why? So there are several reasons why this was not really working well. Um, so it's more of a subjective opinion, I'll say, than a very definite answer. But one reason I believe is that text classification is not as hard as image classification. So here the hard doesn't mean that accuracy is too high. It's more of a, when you're trying to classify an image, you have to really go into the subtle, I would say differences or subtle information that are observed from pixels. Whereas in text classification at the end, what the model usually does or is trained to do is just looking at the words semantics, like, is it positive word, negative word? There are a lot of negative words, then okay, then, then it's a negative sentence. There are a lot of positive words, then it's just positive. And this is such a very strong baseline that model is not able to learn more than that information when it's trained vanilla way, which is supervised way, right? So that's like one, I think, reason why text classification was not so good as a pre-trained model like image classification. So people have tried a bit more difficult task to try transfer learning. And um, I think there were a few cases, for instance, um, question answering and machine translations are a bit more difficult task. So people have observed that actually, um, and plus MT, actually this was observed in Mackin et al. I'll put this in the reading list too. Um, so it makes sense, right? So if you train a model that's on question answering or machine translation, these are relatively more difficult tasks. If you fine tune those models on relatively easier tasks, then in many cases, we saw that it's pretty effective. Actually, the knowledge gets transferred. That was great, but still um, these data sets are not super large. I mean, MT is kind of large, but question answering is, uh, if it's, it's not usually more than 100K. So um, it's not super comparable to image classification. And some people thought, okay, how about language model? That's a task too, right? Language model is task, but it's a bit different task from image classification or other task because it's not a supervised task. It's more of a self-supervised in a, a way that you do not need to label anything you basically have just model there, I mean, data there. I mean, you just basically just, just um, use any data that you have available around you. And you're just trying to guess the next word given the previous words. It's very simple, but very powerful task because there is practically unlimited training data. And apparently it's very hard. So we can say it's hard enough to learn meaningful linguistic features. So if it's too easy, then um, just like text classification, in many cases, the model just, just gives up. Okay, I'm gonna just look at the word semantics instead of the sentence semantics and just trying to um, you know see if the sentence contains positive word or not. But language model would not work that way in, in an easy way. So, so that's why it's hard enough. Um, so that I think the idea was maybe there in, um, pretty early enough. Although I, I, can, I, I will also have to say that um, lang the NLP community, in, especially in the early years, were greatly influenced by computer vision. So the, that was really interesting because you know something pops up in the CPR, for instance, in 2014, and then people try the exact same idea on NLP domain, and then get the paper published in 2015. That was the kind of uh, the, the really the, the trend back then. So that's why actually a lot of things got brought in into NLP. For instance, um, CNN was first used in, the, in, in, in vision, but then it was brought in into the uh, NLP after that for character level embedding, for instance, or sentence classification. And apparently people thought in the same way. So, okay, 
2014, 2015, okay, people are, people are seeing now that transfer learning works. Okay, can we do the same thing in NLP? But um, because of these reasons, although there were some, I would say relatively small, um, non-universal applications of this transfer learning like here, but it was not super clear if such universal um, pre-training exists for many years after the image classification has proven its usefulness. I, I would say like it took about three more years. So maybe some people say that NLP was like three years late. They are three years behind vision in this, in this, um, in this particular um, topic. So, but at least now you know that when, if I say that then actually, did we find an answer? Yes, I think we did find an answer. Our NLP community found an answer in, I will say, 2017. And, and what was that? Um, so that's what we're going to talk about for the first, uh, as a first paper, which is ELMO. And actually, I will say this is actually 2018 because um, it was actually the best paper in the NA, NACL 2018. NACL is like one of the top tier conferences in NLP. So NACL best paper. So um, we're gonna actually, now you have a lot of uh, familiarity with looking into papers directly. I'm gonna go into the paper and then outline what happened back then. So now you see that actually it's called um, it's actually 2018 because um, this was submitted to NACL in 2017, I would say October, November. Um, and the funny thing is actually, no, I'm not NACL, I mean iClear. And it was actually rejected or had got really bad scores from iClear and they resubmitted this to NACL, which was due in December. And it's very, um, very, I think, interesting because it, it almost got rejected from iClear and then it got best paper in NACL. So it's kind of, um, I think, ironic that not everyone, even like the, not everyone actually, you know, um, I would say appreciates a good paper, even if it would be a best paper in some conference. So people have really widely different views, apparently. But yeah, and, and anyways, it got the best paper in NACL 2018. So the title reads, Deep Contextualized Word Representations. So, so we're gonna just read the abstract together and then hopefully um, I can go really go over the paper really quickly without reading everything. So the paper reads, we introduce a new type of deep contextualized word representation that models both complex characteristics of word use and how these, un, uh, use, how these uses vary across linguistic contexts. So easy, uh, uh, so that is to model polysemy, right? I talk about this. Our word vectors are learned functions of the internal states of a deep bidirectional language model, which is pre-trained on a large text corpus. We show that these representations can be easily added to existing models and significantly improve the state of the art across six challenging NLP problems, including question answering, textual entailment, and sentiment analysis. We also present an analysis showing that exposing the deep internals of the pre-trained networks is crucial, allowing downstream models to mix different types of semi-supervision signals. So I'll give you a quite very brief overview of what this paper is about. And actually, if you read the paper, it's very easy to read because there are very, um, very few mathematical equations and it's really clear how this works. So. I think there was a, no, what, so what do they, what did they do? So they trained a language model with LSTM. So they trained language model. You remember how you can train language model with LSTM or transformer. So basically they train language model. So it's like their word one 
and try to guess word two. And now you're given word two, try to get word three. You have word three and you're trying to get word four and then etc. They do this on one direction and they do this on the other direction too. So that's why you have a uh, two language models. But in this case, it's now the other way in, in a sense that you're given W3 and you try to guess W2 and you're given W2, you're trying to get um, W1. And then they basically just concatenate these two LSTMs and then used the output of these two LSTMs as the input for the target task. So the target task has a model. So it's not that the target task, um, it, so basically you have a model for a target task without this pre-training. We have used some uh, LSTM based models. And you remember that this was before transformer, actually not before, but I mean, um, not before transformer, but before BERT. So in case you know what BERT is already. So people used LSTMs and attention mechanisms to do their own task, like question answering, sentiment analysis, uh, et cetera. But then these actually start from the fixed or fine tunable word embeddings. But instead of using these word embeddings, what they're saying is that we're gonna use the output of these LSTMs as the word representations. So that's why the title of the paper is Deep Contextualized Word Representations. They're viewing the word embeddings as not um, independent word semantics, but they're trying to contextualize those word embeddings so that they can be more rich um, when they're put into the downstream task model. So it's very plug and, plug and play type of um, application that you just basically have a these word embeddings obtained from the um, these two language models, two, two bi-directional language models, and then just use those word embeddings, um, just like how you would do with the uh, any uh, task without these pre-trained language models. And how do they do? So let's look at the uh, the table. How well, how much performance they gained? So here, this is a really important. Um, table. And now you can see why this got best paper back then. Because for instance, um, they have a baseline model. So it's uh, some target, um, I would say some, um, some model that's based on LSTM and attention. And they were, they had this 81.1, but when they just replaced those word embeddings with word embeddings with Elmo contextualized word embeddings, they increased by 4.7% points. So a relative improvement is 24.9. And in SNLI, of course, there is not that much gain, only 0.7. But in SRL, which is semantic role labeling, is tagging problem, you get 3.2. In coreference resolution, you get 3.2. NER, you get 2.0, 2.1. And the sentiment classification, SST, you get 3.3. So you can just write a paper just getting like maybe half of this improvement with a single very task specific model. But then what this did was that you just create a model that can improve all tasks, like really entirely uh, a lot of uh, tasks in NLP with a very homogeneous method. And that was why this was very uh, impactful paper back then. And what, that, what this meant is that after this was proposed, now it was clear that if you use Elmo, then you can get your model boosted very easily, right? So what's the, then what happened in the, uh, the reviewing process is that whenever people, some people propose something and then they haven't used Elmo, people say, okay, why haven't you used Elmo? Because it's very apparent that Elmo, I think will improve your model. So, Basically, then that makes everyone to really, it, it forces everyone to use Elmo, whatever they do on NLP. That's what happened um, in early 2018 or late 2017. And there are some discussions where to include Elmo. I told you that the Elmo is included as the, um, in the initial, the first layer of the target architecture. And uh, it's also worth mentioning that although, um, I only put the Elmo as the reading list, but there is also a paper called Cove. Um, it's also 
worth looking into this paper because it was a more of a concurrent paper that I think um, was not, I would say comprehensive, as comprehensive as Elmo, but then still kind of showed a similar idea can really can work, not language model, but from the machine translation data. So that's why they actually compare with the cove in the um, table five and six. And I think there is an interesting table here too, which is really showing the polysemy of a, a word depending on its context, right? So for instance, the word play can have a different meanings in different contexts. So if you just used word embedding glove and find the nearest neighbor, then you see that you're seeing all these like uh, playing, all these like uh, about game playing. But then if you actually put play in this context, then this becomes very different from the play um, that we saw with the glove. So that's the, um, what's called polysemy. Um, it means that the word can have different meanings depending on its context. And apparently simple word vectors cannot really take this into account. Okay, so that's great. Um, I think it's, it, 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 I actually recommend you to read this paper if you're interested in the history. Although I can say probably not many people use Elmo these days because of it's what we're gonna to discuss today, um, the, the follow-up papers, but still um, it's very historically, I think important paper. So, and it's very easy to read because um, as you see, you don't have to explain a lot to when you're trying to create a language model with your LSTM. It looks complicated maybe, but it's just basically saying that you're trying to predict next word given the previous words. Same here, right? It's just trying to say that uh, you're trying to predict the next TK given the all the words up to now or the other way. I think this is like the negative direction. And basically what they're saying is that they just basically just sum these two when they're training and that's it. And they just use the concatenation of these hidden vectors as the input for the um, um, the, the downstream model. It's very easy to read. So definitely recommend to take a look if you're interested. And again, this was in the March 2018th um, archive, but then was originally proposed in the um, October 2017 in the iClear and withdrawn. Okay, so we're gonna have a short break, a three minute break. I'm gonna come back at uh, three, three, four, uh, 326 and we're gonna use the, uh, the remaining 25 minutes on the other two papers, which is GPT-1 and BERT. See you soon.
All right. So let's go into GPT-1 and BERT. Okay, so going back to the Elmo thing. So after the Elmo was introduced, it was clear that um, this was very useful. And this was introduced in October, 2017. And um, we know that the transformer for machine translation only back then was introduced in May, 2017. And actually this was uh, published in Europe's uh, 2017, which was held in December, 2017. So they kind of overlapped. And whenever there are, there are two really great things um, appear in the in the community, some people try to actually, or think about combining them. And if they're orthogonal, of course, and clearly these were orthogonal because Elmo, uh, the idea was that whatever the um, model is, whether it's LSTM or something else, they are showing that when you pre-train this model on, as a language, the model, so they pre-train this on some language model data set, then you can transfer learn it on very many other NLP tasks easily. And transform was basically replacing LSTM on all these complex attention mechanisms um, for the use in the machine translation, right? So there are there a lot of people, I mean, not a lot, but at least some people were interested in using transformer for pre-trained LM. And there was really important, I would say, uh, the, the change of perspective that, okay, if you actually use transformer for pre LM, then is it maybe possible that you do not need any additional layer on top of it? In Elmo, you needed the target task model to do whatever you want. So Elmo was not actually replacing existing model, was more of an augmenting existing model so that they can be better at the task. So people were interested in, or were, were seeing that, oh, our model per achieves like 70%, but if we use Elmo on the, as the word embedding, then we observe that it can improve our model to like, you know, 72%. But some people were interested in, can we actually just not use that target task model at all? Can we just be purely using the language model, but fine tune everything so that they can be um, very good at the target task? So what was the first really the um, paper that proposed this? And actually it was a GPT-1. So actually uh, some people actually are not too super aware of that because people think that GPT-1 um, what was already like GP2 or three that they were interested in generative um, modeling, but actually it's not. Um, so let's look into GPT-1. And I think it's um, not as many times cited as GPT-2 or three, but they introduced very in, in a very important concept. So it's really worth mentioning. So this was proposed in um, May, or actually not May, sorry, was June 2018. And clearly it's after Elmo and Transformer, right? Because Transformer was, was something like May and Elmo was on iClear, it was uh, October. And the, so let's read the um, abstract together and see if the abstract actually agrees with what we, what we said, what I said. So natural language understanding comprises a wide range of diverse tasks such as textual entailment, question answering, semantic similarity assessment, and document classification. Although large and labeled text corpora are abundant, labeled data for learning these specific tasks is scarce making it challenging for discrim discriminatively trained models to perform adequately. 
We demonstrate that large gains on these tests can be realized by generative pre-training of a language model on a diverse corpus of unlabeled text, followed by discrim discrim discriminative fine tuning on each specific task. In contrast to previous approaches, this is an important part, we make use of task aware input transformation during fine tuning to achieve effective transfer while requiring minimal change to the model architecture. So they do not change much in the model architecture, but they actually um, transform the, uh, the inputs for the target task. So we demonstrate the effectiveness of our approach on a wide range of benchmarks for natural language understanding. Our general task agnostic model outperforms discrimin discriminatively trained models that use architecture specifically crafted for each task, significantly improving upon the state of the art in nine out of the 12 tasks studied. For instance, we achieve absolute improvements of 8.9% on common sense reasoning, 5.7% 5, 5 on question answering, and 1.5% on textual entitlement. So, if you actually look at the paper, here is it. Um, so what they did was, it's very simple actually. They basically used the transformer decoder for the language model. So we saw that you can use the transformer decoders for language model, just like LSTM. And then they also fine tune that on the target task. But there is uh, several things that you have to be aware of. First of all is, okay, um, what if there are several inputs, like question answering, you have a lot of inputs, right? So how do you actually put this into your model? And the answer here was that, why don't we just concatenate them into one? So here it is. So um, if it's classification, that's simple, just put text, right? But if you're trying to compare two sentences, then instead of modeling, model, modeling them independently, you concatenate them and then just consider that as a one sequence. That's what they do here. They just concatenate this into one sequence, premise and hypothesis for entailment. And of course, question answering has a similar um, input structure. They have a context and question. So they just concatenate them and then they just put this into pre-trained transformer decoder, of course. And that was pre-trained on some language corpus and then after that, you just have one, you just need one layer, one linear layer on top of that to do the target task because you just only have to do classification. This is actually very different from how Elmo approached the problem because Elmo wanted to see the the word embeddings. I mean, Elmo wanted to see the pretend language models as the replacement of the word embeddings. That's why they were just constrained to that. They just replaced word embeddings and the target task model has to exist. But what the GPT-1 did was that, why don't we just try to get rid of the target task, target specific model and just add one, one layer on top of the transformer if needed to do the target task. And that makes sense because if the transformer is able to do all the things, then you just need one layer on top of that. Of course, um, yeah, it's easy to really realize that this might work after um, it's proposed, but before it's been, it was proposed, it was not super easy to actually um, see that this would work. And I think a lot of, uh, um, advancements, I think, not just scientific advancement, but in many, like, um, I would say, some um, some innovations happen this way, right? Once they have been done, it's so apparent that why haven't Elmo thought about this, right? Why don't we just try to do the task on top of the LSTM? And actually, there's one reason, because LSTM is very constrained compared to um, LSTM with attention. So probably, if, even if they did that, they would have seen that oh, it's not working well. And that's because of the limitation of the LSTM. But because Transformer was entirely replacing LSTM plus attention mechanism, and it, it was very powerful enough that they were able, able to actually observe that 
if you put just one layer on top of transformer, then and just fine tune everything, then it works really well. I mean, at least on the on the task that they tried, and they do the same thing for all the um, different NLP tasks. And actually, this paper was the first paper that was really arguing that okay, you don't really need to um, separate two inputs. You can just consider it as one input with some delimiter in, in between them. So there is no complication between having like one input, one text input, or two text inputs like question answering, or maybe in some cases you might have three text input. Why don't you just concatenate them all together and then just consider that as one input? It's a very simple way to really approach the problem because it simplifies a lot of architectural constraints. Um, and that they GPT-1 was really the first people to really propose that from OpenAI. But now you might wonder, okay, that's really great. But why haven't they really um, got much attention like uh, any other work? Because many of you probably haven't heard of this. And also maybe many of you haven't read this paper at all too. That's because I think there are several reasons. One is that um, their benchmarks, what they tested this model on was not really good data sets, I would say, because they were not super popular data sets. For instance, question answering. Um, wait, where's the, um, not this one. Okay, so here's the, here are the data sets, right? But as you see, first of all, the results were not super good. Um, the result was not bad in MNLI and MNLI MM, but the only difference was something like, and Elmo didn't report on this, so it's not it was not clear if they are better than Elmo. They reported on SNLI and they improved by 0.6%, but apparently that's not super attractive, 0.6% improvements. And these data sets were very minor ones relatively. So people were not too, too much interested. That, that's why it's empty here. It's empty here, right? And also these data sets are also minor. That's why we don't see any baseline numbers at all from Elmo. They on, we only see from some other models that people are not super aware of. So apparently when people read this paper, well, the idea is very neat, but it's not really showing too much improvement as much as they claim in the abstract because they are testing on relatively unknown data sets. So why did they do that? Um, there are several probably reasons, I think. One reason I think is that they did not get good enough performance. That's why they couldn't report on those popular data sets. Then you might ask, why did they not get good enough performance? And at this point, we know the reason because it was because of the scale. Scale was not big enough. So, um, we'll see that the, the model was not large enough. And that's like probably the really one reason. And they were not, they did not have good training mechanisms that they knew. I mean, they did not know what would be the best way to train this model. So they had a great idea, but the execution I think was not good enough that the paper did not get enough attention that it should have deserved if it got good results. But apparently they introduced really very significant ideas in this paper. One is that why don't you just concatenate every input so that the transformer can take care of these like um, delimiters or how they can be separated inside the inputs. And they also propose the idea of instead of putting a lot of heavy layers on top of the pre trained language model, just like how Elmo did, why don't we just get rid of all those that and then just put one layer on top of that. Um, so, and that idea was exactly what um, the Google people were really got interest into and um, basically led to the development of BERT. And now we see that, of course, this was last version is 2019, May 24th, but um, it was originally proposed in 18, so 2018 October. So we get the timeline here, right? So Elmo was, uh, the transformer was 20 points, 2017 um, May, 
And then there was Elmo, which was um, October 2017. And then now we see 2018 June, which is GPT. And then now we see it, how it goes to BERT. And it was clear that BERT was largely influenced by GPT and also Elmo because they actually exactly mentioned that here, right? Pierce et al, 2018, that's Elmo. And Redford et al, 2018, that's the GPT. So what happened? So um, um, there are some actually very interesting story I heard from, from these people. Uh, um, so they, I heard, I, I, actually I heard that. So they actually read the GPT paper and back then, GPT was from OpenAI, but OpenAI did not have good enough infrastructure to really scale this up. Now they do, but back then they did not. And so the Google people were interested in, can they just scale this up and then make it work really well? So that's that. So as far as I know, they actually started right after GPT was released. They thought this is a really interesting project. And it was about the time that in, in Google, the TensorFlow and the TPU got very uh, stabilized. So they were able to actually uh, get rid of, get, uh, make use of a um, super large TPU cluster, not just like a one server, which usually consists of only eight GPUs, or I would say in this case, 16 TPU chips. They were able to connect um, something like a four to eight servers together and then train, um, do a distributed training. So, so the Google people were, were, had the infrastructure to do this. They just got this infrastructure ready around this time. So then um, they were very eager to scale this up uh, very, a lot. Um, very a lot means here that, um, so it's even now, it's not super easy to actually reproduce BERT in a local environment because um, they actually say that here, where is it? Um, let's see. They actually use, um, when they're pre-training language model, they make sure that their batch size is really large. It's like 512. And I think they mentioned where the, how many computer chips they use. Okay. Hmm. I'm trying to find that out. Hmm. They have, uh... okay, so if I remember correctly, they used um, four instances of a 16 TPU chip. So there are 64 TPU chips, but 64 TPU chips is uh, almost equivalent to like 32 v uh, V100 GPUs. So you can think of it as about four servers connected all together. Uh, for a V100 servers connected, basically. And looks like I cannot find that um, so easily right now. But one important thing they also did was that they use a super large best size of 512. And other things were really similar. So they basically just concatenate the inputs in the same way that GPT did. Um, but the results were phenomenal. It was very, um, it was like very striking because GPT was not in the uh, major data sets that NLP community was interested in, but then BERT was right into those major data sets because these people were actually from NLP community. So they knew what pe NLP people would be interested in. And namely they are, um, as you see, uh, here it is. Um, these data sets, some of them are great but uh, they're like classification data set, but um, one of the most important result was on squad, which is here. And as you see, when they did a lot of ensemble and um, some more transfer learning, 
they're able to uh, reach 93.2%, whereas the previous best model was um, say 91.7%. So they increased by 1.5% and you might think, wait, is that good enough? But you have to know that this ensemble model, these like NLM net tree net were very heavily engineered. They were like composed of a lot of Elmo. They are very slow. They are not paralyzable. It's very complex, a lot of code. And now this bird is just one transformer architecture. And the really the amazing thing was that once you have pre-trained BERT on large language corpus, which might take a lot of time, but you can just bring this and then just fine tune on the target task. And the fine tuning only takes 30 minutes. So that was really crazy because if you can just fine tune a like human performance model in 30 minutes back then, it was very um, mind blowing. And not only that, they were actually getting state of the art very easily on all these classification data sets. And these fine tuning only took like 30 minutes as well. So this was very shocking because, wait, I have been working on all these different models, trying to put my inductive bias as a researcher into these models and trying to make them better. And then now this bird comes in and then it just has to fine tune for 30 minutes and just beat my model in a large margin. Like for instance, here, like, um, which was it, um, SST2, it's very popular data set too, right? 94.9 and the previous best number was 93.2. So 1.7% improvement without, actually this was a GPT though. So except for GPT it was a 90.4%. Um, so like there are 4.5% improvement without any task specific engineering. And the same thing happens on all kinds of data sets that they actually tested. And apparently BERT is being used in many other data sets since then. So that's why I think uh, BERT really was, was smart because they actually scaled up GPT. And, and also actually it's a bit different because uh, it's not entirely language model. They actually use mask language model. So we're gonna talk about that soon um, when we go into, um, I would say, um, probably next class and also uh, class after that when we talk about la large language models. But I think, um, so we're gonna come back to BERT. I'm not gonna talk all about, uh, I'm not talk about everything about BERT today, but uh, I wanted to give you the heads up so that you know what has been happening in 2017 and 2018 and coming back to our lecture slide before we end the class. So this opens up the era of pre trained language models. And we um, now you see how the size goes up. We have a number of parameters. And ELMO was 94 million, GPT one was 110, and BERT was 340. So this was about the same. And this was uh, three times bigger. And now we start to see that this now goes up really fast. So OpenAI GPT-2, it's three times bigger. And then soon, basically they uh, propose something called, um, I would say like um, T5 in um, 2019, which is now almost like eight times bigger. And then now the, this is like 11 billion, right? And then now the GPT-3 is 175 billion. It's like one, 15 times bigger. So that's how it goes, right? Since 2018, only like three years ago. So we, we, we don't have class on Wednesday, by the way. Um, you know, it's, it's a holiday in Korea. So we're gonna cover, uh, we're gonna come back to this on Monday with a bit more details on birds and also tools that have appeared with these that go along with this uh, paradigm shift. Especially we're gonna talk about hugging face tool because we're gonna use that for assignment four and also maybe for your final project. All right, so thank you. And um, I'll see you on next Monday. Good luck with your assignment three. Thanks. <laughs>